So, Keith, that was the week. Uh, was this the week that finally f Facebook began to crack? Finally, we began to see the edifice begin, at least, to crumble. The old statue being dragged down from Silicon Valley. Well, I think it's the question of the week. Um, you know, Silicon Valley is all about its success stories, of which there are many. And Facebook is one of them. Um, Facebook met with its internal committee this week that is holding it to account. And they basically gave, according to The Guardian, a negative report. I, I personally think this was the week that Facebook's opponents began to crack. Mm. Um, it's interesting that the tide, it feels to me, is turning against the cancel culture. And I think the people who want Facebook to change are essentially the same people as the cancel culture people. And, and so I think the discussion around Facebook is really a discussion around cancel culture. It's not actually about Facebook. And whereas last week, I didn't think Facebook had any friends. This week, after the Harper's um, signatory list with uh, Noam Chomsky and many others, um, we'll remind us who else was on that list, it feels as if the supporters of uh, a more open culture where debates are had even against people you strongly disagree with, even when they're racists, even when they're sexists, even when they're transphobes, uh, are, on, are on the uptick. And those who are saying close them down are now having to defend themselves. I'm not sure that's right, because I think the debate about Facebook is as a platform not for the distribution of offensive ideas, but for the distribution of propaganda, which is paid for by foreign powers or agencies. Um, so my, oh, yeah. under, my understanding of Facebook or, or the debate about Facebook is to shut down that content, which clearly is designed to undermine and upset democracy. No one's ever arguing that you shouldn't be able to say something slightly offensive on Facebook. That's another issue. Well, Andrew, are you saying that anything that isn't pro-democracy is a problem? Because there's lots of people who are not pro-democracy who are kind of normal people. No, but there's a difference between, and, and again, you know more about this than I do in terms of the, 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 uh, the articles of the week, but there's a difference between paid for propaganda that usually is coming from Russia, perhaps from China, who, are, who knows from where else, uh, which is published anonymously or dishonestly and designed to undermine democracy, designed for us to hate each other, designed to foster racism and, and racial hatred, versus somebody who is pro-Trump or even pro-Orban or Erdogan or even pro-Chinese Communist Party. Those are two different debates, aren't they? I don't think they're different when it comes to uh, whether they should have the right to say what they think. I think the content is certainly different, um, but the, the, the idea that we more liberal people should close down or in some way impede those less liberal than ourselves, I just don't agree with that. Um, no, but, 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 hold on, wait a minute. Let, let, let's separate two things. We're not talking about your beliefs, Keith Tears' beliefs. We're talking about the current public battle over Facebook between uh, activist critics of one kind or another and uh, the, the corporation known as Facebook, or <coughs> as they call themselves, the Facebook company. Um, I don't think that the, the, the critics of, of, of Facebook, the free presses of the world, the people now who are taking on Sandberg and Zuckerberg, are saying that Facebook has to edit stuff that's offensive. They're saying it has to police propaganda. Those are two different issues. I don't disagree because I, I mean, I don't agree. I think the word propaganda is a weaponized word to describe anything they disagree with, anything they don't believe. And 
course, the world's full of people who don't believe each other. So the minute we decide that something is propaganda, uh, George Orwell teaches us this, uh, that's just a way to marginalize it and make it illegitimate. And it's just, it's just not okay. Propaganda's fine. Uh, look at the history of the United States government in, in Central America. Um, you know, it's full of propaganda. Every government in the world uses, let's call it, arguments to reinforce their case, which is propaganda. Um, some of it is true, some of it is lies. But, but, it, uh, it, uh, but it's, if you put it on Voice of America, or if you put it on one of the Russian propaganda stations, that's fine. But not if Vladimir from Vladivostok is claiming to be Joe from Kansas and posting stuff on Facebook about Obama or Biden or Hillary Clinton. Those are two quite different issues, aren't they? So we're, what we're, not, we're not talking about quote-unquote propaganda or lies. We're talking about the accountability of the content. And my, or my understanding of, of the critique of Facebook is it's become a, a platform for willful propaganda, which isn't accountable. Yeah, and it's also a platform for me. Yeah, um, but no one's, no one's saying you can't post. No one's saying, no one's even saying that you shouldn't be able to post stuff that some people might consider to be offensive. No one's saying that you can't argue against con council culture or even against the very idea of identity politics, are they? No, I th I th look, let's put it in context. The, the internet that was created, massive, global publishing platforms. Right. Uh, with, with, and there's more than one. And, you know, even the smaller ones have hundreds of millions of people. Um, th this ability to publish on what is effectively a democracy war is now ubiquitous everywhere, even in China where the government tried to stop it. The reason they tried to stop it is because it's there. Um, so, so if it wasn't there, they wouldn't try and stop it. it. It's everywhere. Technology empowers the individual, whether acting anonymously or in their formal, to have a point of view, just like letters to the editor. Anonymous people can make up names about a letter to the editor. It's up to the editor whether to publish it. But isn't there a difference between, let's take the, I don't know, the Hillary Clinton story about uh, operating a, a pedophile ring out of a pizza parlor in New Jersey that was, I don't know who originally spread it, but it became uh, a story or what people would call a meme during the last election. It's one thing for someone to actually believe that and post about it. It's quite another for a troll who is paid for by, say, Putin to be operating out of uh, an office in St. Petersburg or a building in St. Petersburg, uh, using Facebook to destructively spread that lie, isn't there? Yeah, although he's probably using software to do that. Not well, whatever. I mean, again, but, 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 but look. clapping down on, on bots, on, on bots well, that are paid for and designed by foreign yeah. governments or foreign I, agents? I, I don't share that concern. I don't. Um, I, I absolutely acknowledge that's happening. I don't have a concern about it because I don't see anyone that isn't already going to being persuaded by it. It's, it's basically um, uh, a waste of effort. Um, why did Donald Trump win the election? Was it because of that? You know, the saddest thing about the Democrats is they actually believe they lost the election because of foreign intervention. Well, some do. But let, let's, let's move on then to um, the reality of Facebook, uh, I don't know, however many hundred billion dollar company they are. Is this advertising boycott for real? Should people with Facebook stock consider selling? Well, the first thing to say is about 80% of Facebook's advertising revenue comes from people like me, small advertisers who are seeking attention for a post they did. So even if every major advertiser in the world pulled out of Facebook, we would have a 20% impact on Facebook. So it, it's not an economic threat to them. The second thing to say to those who are in favor of the advertising world is if you were to put Facebook and advertisers upon the 
platform and ask the question, which of them do you most trust with opinions? I'm not, I'm not sure advertisers would win. Advertisers clearly are massively self-interested and don't want to be associated with anything controversial. So if you have even a single controversial view, an advertiser isn't your friend um, on, on any side of the political spectrum. So to, to, to think that advertisers are in some way Progressive agents of change is is quite remarkable. Well, and speaks well, more advertisers about would like to think of themselves in that way, and that's part of their brand building exercise in 2020. Right. What do you think? I mean, I, I don't. Think, I can't even think of a single brand I'd trust over Mark Zuckerberg. You well, that's another. So you're saying that all brands are more dishonest than Zuckerberg? Well, in their own in, in their own. Um, own small way in their echo chamber, they're entirely motivated by a single goal, which is profit for their company. Um, now Zuckerberg probably is as well, but I think it would be fair to say he seems to have other goals as well, which are well articulated, over, including not interfering just because he disagrees, which is a worthy goal. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, we could argue about Unilever, there are a lot of companies which are trying to balance their own self-interest with some effort to, to make the world a better place. Um, and, and what about the spillover? You're into the, 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 uh, the cancel culture. Maybe it's connected with Facebook, maybe not. There was a very controversial letter published this week in um, Harper's, in Harper's uh, which critiqued cancel culture, uh, claiming that it was um, problematic for liberalism. Is that fair? Do you share the concern of this, this Harper's letter? I, I strongly share the concern. It's, it's more than a concern. It's a fear for the future. Uh, if, 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 you know, so, for example, I, you know, I, back in 98, I published a book called Under Siege about racial violence um, at college, I joined, I, I, I was straight, but I joined the Gay Liberation Society uh, to support gay rights and was together with uh, a well known lady called uh, 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 Sue Clark, the builder of the Clark Shoes Empire, uh, was a major part of the women's liberation movement back in 1974. I am of the left, always have been, always will be. I never believed it right to what's called no platform views I disagreed with because by doing so, not because I cared about the proponents of those views, but by, because I cared about persuading people those views were wrong. And no platforming or closing down, bullying, threatening, all of the things which are actually happening today is coming from the left to the opponents of the left. To me, that is dangerous for the left and will guarantee that the future will not reflect their views. Um, it, it will go the other way. The reaction against this will be far bigger than the cancel culture. And, and so it's very short-sighted and self-defeating. Silicon Valley has also stumbled into this. Apart from Facebook, there's increasing animosity among some VCs and entrepreneurs towards the New York Times, who they view as the epitome of cancel culture from the traditional media point of view. What is happening with uh, the New York Times and Silicon Valley that, in, in your mind at least, is resulting in almost an open war now between the two camps? So I, I actually don't agree with them. Um, Jason Calacanis was one of the people involved in that, and he was on CNBC's Squawk Alley this week. Um, berating the New York Times for what he called negativity in, in, in relationship to the Valley. He was pleading with them for one story out of ten to be a positive story about a startup that might change the world. Now, I don't disagree with that. Journalists tend to be looking for problems. Um, I remember at TechCrunch not liking it when TechCrunch created something called, um, what was it called, Death? It was uh, part of TechCrunch for companies that failed. Yeah, but TechCrunch was the ultimate booster of Silicon Valley. I mean, well, it's a, go and look at whatever it was called, Death Something. I forgot what it was called now. But the New York Times, to me, should not be closed down 
just because it's being negative. Well, no one's saying it should, are they? Well, well, closed down as in boycott. Jason and some of his friends were arguing to boycott the New York Times. If they're not going to write positive things, we're, we're not going to talk to them. To me, that is cancel culture that, that reflected through Jason. They're trying to cancel the New York Times, uh, not, not ban it, but boycott it. it the, whole, the whole movement towards anger being translated into, I'm not playing, I'm taking my ball home. Mm. That's what's wrong. It's, uh, it's an example of what uh, Mark Bly, the distinguished economist at Brown University, calls angry-nomics. He has a new book out about this. Um, right. And uh, I, I think uh, it, it's, it's an interesting, you're absolutely right. People's, people's response always to these things is to block, to boycott, rather than just say, okay, I don't agree with this, but I still continue to subscribe. Yeah, I had an interesting back and forth on Twitter this week where I was opposing cancel culture and quite a lot of people were in favor of it. And um, I'll, I'll put a link to it in the newsletter, but um, it was incredibly civil, even though the points of view were wide, widely apart. And a third party reading it would have been able to figure out for themselves what they think. What's the opportunity here for Silicon Valley? Because ultimately that, that's how most of us think here. Uh, can they become the bridge between these worlds? Um, can we design products, solutions, platforms that begin to address and fix this brouhaha over cancel culture? Are we the problem? Is it the Facebooks and Twitters of the world that are the problem? Um, two, two different questions. Firstly, you know, What's going to happen and can we be the bridge? I think the, the short-term answer is sadly no. I think what we're in is the very early stages of the balkanization of the internet where everyone retreats into their little uh, you know, bubbles. Not so early, Keith. I mean, a few years ago, someone wrote the splinter net. People have been warning about this for years. I think it's happening. There's going to be the Serbs and the Croats and the Montenegrins. Um, and, um, Never, never shall they meet and drink together. And, and that is driven by a combination of identity politics, where who you are is more important than the fact that you're a human being. Right. Um, and therefore, collective interest goes away. That, that goes to a pretty ugly place. Um, and I think, you know, I, I certainly don't want to see that happen. Software can't actually fix it. There has to be the desire to fix it. And the desire isn't there right now. I don't agree. I, I think that software can fix it. I think these issues are really, particularly on the, on the race and gender and sexual identity front, these are really about feelings. People are saying, you can't understand how it feels to be me. You can't understand how it feels to be black or a woman or a transgender or a white male. And that has to be the next challenge or frontier of software. Why, why shouldn't software ultimately, you know, with my watch or my smartphone or something plugged into my head, why shouldn't it allow me to understand or feel or even experience what it means to be different, to be someone that I'm not, that I'm currently not, that isn't Andrew Keane or Keith Tier? You know, for those readers who are familiar with the subject, that, that, that's the ultimate postmodernism. But postmodernism is that everyone's unique um, and only has control over their own close proximity. And, you know, so things like um, magazines that explain to you how to decorate your bedroom are the new, you know, they've replaced Das Kapital that explained how to change the world. Um, so postmodernism is the narrowing of the focus of change. It feels to me as if um, racial oppression, sexual oppression, gender oppression, religious oppression are all symptomatic of uh, macro culture that um, needs discrimination in order to survive itself. But uh, Keith, I just gave you the next multi trillion dollar opportunity, and you've fallen back on a critique of postmodernism. 
What about software or technology that allows us to escape from ourselves, that gets us beyond postmodernism, if you like, a post-postmodernist technology and uh, product and opportunity? Isn't that what we need now? Well, th this is where my normal stance, which is to be a technological determinist, uh, where technology can do a lot, um, is replaced by um, um, the, the understanding that consciousness has to precede being. That is to say, unless, unless you can think something, you can't make it. And uh, so uh, I think the first challenge for the human race is to think at the level of humanity all of us, and then to figure out how equality uh, can be delivered at the macro level through structural change. If we can't do that, we're going to fight each other for scarce resources, limited attention spans, and it's all going to be me, me, me. But, now, but, but, but Keith, why isn't there technology, or why shouldn't there be technology which allows me to experience what it's like to be Keith Tier? Because I think, tier. you know, you remember that movie, uh, Being uh, John Malkovich, which imagined that yeah. in a science fictional sense. Aren't we on the frontiers of this with neural networks and other technologies? No, no, because consciousness and experience are unique. They're just irrelevant. We, each one of us is basically irrelevant. We're only relevant together. And so understanding each other at the individual level isn't the problem. I, I can never, you know, have a black skin and be treated as a person with a black skin has been treated through their life. And any effort for me to do that would be wasted. But what I can do is say you can't, it's not okay to kill a black person in the street. It's not okay for people to be supported because of the color of their skin. It's not okay to beat someone up because they're not the same as you. So, you so technology will never allow you to be popped into somebody else's skin and mind and consciousness. And I, and I don't want it to be because I don't want to undermine that unique experience. It is a unique experience. It just isn't valid against all other experiences. It's just one component of a total set of experiences which we, the human race, have collectively. And racism, sadly, is structural. It's okay. not an well, experienced let's, individual. Let's, let's end where we began with Facebook. I acknowledge that maybe that software won't and can't exist, but 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 let, imagine being inside Mark Zuckerberg. What's he thinking and do? Uh, what's it like being Mark Zuckerberg today in July of 2020? What's going on in his head? How does it feel to be Mark Zuckerberg? Being Mark Zuckerberg, let's get some money and make the movie, Keith. So I, you know. To be consistent, I think the answer is we don't know, but we can necessarily. We well, can obviously, that it's a speculative we, thing. We, we, we can speculate. Probably even Mark Zuckerberg doesn't know, but, but we can speculate. Mark's advised by some interesting people, the former Liberal Party politician from the UK, Nick um, Clegg. Clegg, who are experienced opinion shapers. So the fact that Mark has this internal committee that's meant to hold this accountable, the fact that we met with him this week, the fact that uh, the findings were published in The Guardian. I don't know whether they were leaked or whether they were made available. Uh, either way, it tells you that Mark Zuckerberg is acting like the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company should act, which is showing that he's listened, engaging with the criticisms, uh, holding the line where he believes that's the right thing to do, and explaining why. So he's basically in what I would think of as a, a a symbolic war room, fighting for the survival of this country, doing what so he believes. So you acknowledge it's a survival. This is a serious war. This is not trivial. This is not. Oh, this it's is not, not trivial, and it's not just about Facebook. If Facebook were to go down, uh, there'd be lots of other things that would need to go down next. If the people that want that won. So it's a great issue. And, and finally, finally, Keith, very briefly. Are you a, a bull? Are you bullish or bearish on Facebook? Should we buy or sell Facebook stock? You know, I sold it and my wife bought it uh, out of the pandemic. So uh, well, the, that's, uh, you got to be married. To, I, I'm not married. So what should I do? I, I I would say right now, don't buy it. 
I would have uh, said you we, said find a wife, right? Yeah, you could, well, that, I, that would be bad advice from me to you. Yeah. Rich wife, anyway, who can afford Facebook stock. But, but be, buy or sell, Keith. Yeah. I, I, I would sell right now just because it's very up. And uh, I think the market's ready for a correction. But that's just a temporary point of view based on the current market.